Tory, and I represent Ducks Unlimited in the Great Lakes, uh, where we have over 200,000 members who are deeply committed and passionate about wetland conservation. Um, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is probably the great success story of the new century. Yeah, you're going to hear that we need more of this and more of that, except for Asian carp. And I concur that we need more robust funding to the tune of $475 million a year. But I do want to tell you what in the Great Lakes is going on in terms of some of the success stories. Ducks Unlimited and our group of about 30 different partners have been very active getting a lot of things done. And those partners include federal uh, the uh, state and uh, local governments, other conservation organizations. A lot is happening, a lot of success stories. For instance, Next week, Friday, we are going to dedicate the first Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Habitat Project to be uh, completed, and that's at Shiawassee National Wildlife Refuge, 141 acres of floodplain uh, farmland that was restored to wetland. Last week, we sprayed more than 1,200 acres of Phragmites, and that's being sprayed and controlled all over the Great Lakes. Two weeks ago, we secured a easement right on the shore of Maumee Bay, sandwiched between two other GLRI projects, the Duso Farm, which is going to be a 64-acre restoration of uh, wetlands in Lake Plain Prairie that's being restored by DU and Michigan DNR. And adjacent to that is the Erie Shooting Club, which is going to be restored uh, by TNC NOAA and the Erie Shooting Club. Um, this summer, DU and multiple partners removed seven culverts and restored trout access to 10 miles of Bowes Creek up in uh, northern Michigan. Um, this past Friday, Michigan DNR turned on brand new pumps to supply water to 500 acres of wetlands up in Saginaw Bay. Um, I can go on and on, um, but the important thing is, is that we're restoring wetlands, we're, we're protecting conservation lands, we're, we're uh, knocking back invasive species, improving water quality, and that's just the half of it. The key thing is that we're creating jobs and we're boosting the economy. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is a true stimulus to move Great Lakes Restoration forward like no other program. <coughs> and in that stimulus comes jobs and work for people in the Great Lakes. DU has determined that it takes at least 54 different job titles to do a restoration project. We hire local contractors, fabricators, machinists, biologists, technicians, uh, and, and many others. Now is not the time to cut federal or state investment. Now is the time to put those resources in areas and with people and partners that can get things done, and that place is in the Great Lakes. Outdoor recreation is also huge and healthy business here in the Great Lakes with our fish and wildlife and water resources. I'm not going to give you numbers, but what I'm going to tell you is that those restoration jobs and those outdoor recreation jobs are jobs that can't be imported or, excuse me, exported across the, the ocean. Those are jobs that stay right here in our, in our society and our citizens and they improve our quality of life. So the bottom line is DU wants to see a strong continued investment of $475 million in the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We want to see a strong em emphasis on implementation of projects on the ground and in the water. And we want to see that uh, uh, accelerated efforts towards ecological separation of the watersheds to uh, protect us from invasive species. Thank you. Well, Cheeto, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I really, uh, I think, you know, your part about implementation is just dead on. Um, you know, in the early part of Great Lakes policy history, there was a lot of work on policy development. You still see that happening, but we've entered the age of execution and implementation. And that's, in, in many ways, that's the best way to keep making the case for why this investment is so important. So thank you for that. I'm going to take one quick liberty here. You know, this is really exciting for me to just see the level of interest and excitement and the thought that's going into all of your various comments. I want to just recognize one person that I see in the room because she was ambling up towards the, the exit, and I want to recognize her before she leaves, if she is leave, leaving, and that is Lee Botts, who's back in the corner of the room back there. You know, uh, we're here today, we collectively, having a dialogue 
talking about what's best for the Great Lakes, providing comments in a lot of ways because of the groundbreaking work that Lee did back in the 1960s. Um, so Lee, thank you for your work over the decades. We're here because of you. Thank you for, for everything you've done. And don't leave. <laughs> She hates it when I put her on the spot like that. I'm sorry, Mike, for holding you up, and I, I apologize to my fellow panelists, but uh, that, was, that was very important to me. Thanks a lot. Michael Murray, staff scientist with the Na National Wildlife Federation's Great Lakes office in Ann Arbor. And actually, uh, I'll second the, uh, the, the thanks to uh, uh, Lee Botts for all of her work on the, uh, the agreements in Great Lakes uh, work through, uh, through, the, through the decades. It's been an inspiration for all of us. I know definitely for our office and a lot of others working on Great Lakes issues. Um, I just wanted to turn briefly to the U.S. side, um, just following up on Gito Torrey's comments. Uh, I'm sure this has been said a lot, a lot earlier today, and unfortunately I got here a bit late. But just in terms of the GLRI, we're the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We're really appreciative of the federal leadership, both within the administration and Congress, on, uh, on establishing the initiative and moving it forward. Uh, just to again echo Gito, we really believe that it should be fully funded at uh, $475 million annually. So uh, look, we hope, hope to see that. Um, in these uh, coming years. Uh, we also think that um, the investment should continue to be focused on, on high, the highest priority on the ground in the water activities that pr can produce the greatest um, restoration res results. We know we have a lot of work to do still, but, there are, but I think we have a decent sense, not perfect, but a decent sense of where we might uh, further undertake restoration protection projects to, to, uh, to maximize protection of, uh, of the Great Lakes. Um, and, and along those lines, we're, we recognize that there's a need for uh, both research and monitoring to be funded as part of the GLRI at adequate levels, potentially even up to, say, a quarter uh, of the overall funding to really to, and, and not just uh, you know, for, for pure research, but really to help inform the restoration and protection efforts that we're doing uh, in the region to make sure that they're, that they're working um, and to, to be able to adapt, to modify as needed if things change course through the, uh, through the course of individual restoration projects. And then finally, in terms of partnerships, uh, we, we like the idea of um, promoting watershed restoration uh, and, and encourage uh, EPA to put together a more flexible RFP that encourages more, better encourages collaboration and partnerships, um, and doing that in the context of, uh, of setting geographic priorities. Um, a, a more integrated approach to, um, to restoration the re uh, in the lakes, potentially tackling, say, a suite of stressors with a single project, we think has the potential for, uh, for uh, more significant impacts. Um, and also, we, again, we need to consider the idea of prioritiz prioritizing uh, restoration work in particular geographic areas, given the fact that we have finite resources to work with. Uh, the, the Healing Our Waters Coalition, of which um, NWF's co-founder, and, and I'm the co-chair of the Technical Advisory Committee for the coalition. We went through a prioritization process a couple years ago and, and came up with five geographic uh, focus areas. Um, and so we'd like to see the same kind of thing happen with, uh, with the GLRI. And finally, just wanted to mention, uh, I think it might have been mentioned earlier today, but a, a report that NWF put together, uh, released last week, called Feast and Famine in the Great Lakes. Um, it's basically talking about the nutrient and invasive species interactions in the lakes and the way that nutrients basically have been, because of the effect of uh, invasive species, zebra and quagga mussels, have been, uh, const nutrients have been concentrated more in the nearshore areas, uh, depleted in the offshore areas, and leading to major problems with algae bloom blooms in the nearshore areas, fisheries uh, collapse in the offshore areas. And we think that should inform how we uh, look up at all of our programs, including the water quality agreement renegotiation and implementation of individual programs with within um, each country. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> uh, before you step away from the microphone, I think I heard you mention a, a percentage that might be uh, dedicated to, to monitoring to help inform investment decisions. And I wanted to, to ask, um, is in your experience, is that based on other models that you know? How did you arrive at that percentage? Well, actually, um, I know different groups have, have looked at uh, different numbers. I, I've seen like 10% before coming from, um, I'm not sure if it was the Council of Great Lakes Research Managers or which entities, um, but there, um, I, I think 10% would probably be a minimum. A bit more might be good, but this is for both research and monitoring. So, but again, they, we believe they really should be, those efforts should be directed at, at understanding implementation of current projects 
desires and, and needs uh, to ensure that we're really maximizing the effectiveness of, of our efforts. Okay, thank you, because I know we're going to be wrestling with those kinds of questions as part of the Science Advisory uh, Board review of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Action Plan, not the SAB that you guys have, our own SAB. Everybody should have their own SAB. Uh, the priorities, another very important po point that you made, Mike, um, back in May, the federal agencies hosted a couple of conference calls for people to weigh in on what the priorities ought to be. And um, I was thrilled that we had well over 200 people and groups represented on those calls from states, municipalities, tribes, uh, civic organizations, businesses, you name it. And what you heard the administrator say today um, was really important for two reasons, not just because we're articulating priorities in terms of areas of concern that we want to get the do job done on, not just in terms of some of the watersheds where we really need to make progress uh, with our, har our harmful algal blooms and cutting uh, phosphorus uh, and invasive species. It was also important because that's the loop back to all of you. You know, what you heard today was based in large part on what we heard based on your input from May. So, you know, keep that advice coming. Uh, now that we've heard it, we, can, we still need to make adjustments and things like that, but, you know, we want to move ahead and we want to get the job done, uh, especially in those AOCs right now while we can. So thank you for the emphasis on the priorities, Mike. Thanks a lot. I just just uh, comment that thank you again for raising the importance of science. I think the, the meetings this week have really raised the importance of science. We saw terrific presentations at the Science Advisory Board uh, meeting uh, uh, the other night. Uh, we've seen a number of reports coming out uh, in the lead up to this conference. Uh, emphasizing the importance of our Great Lakes science, the importance of doing uh, a synthesis of science so that, that we pull that together and inform decision making, and the importance of identifying priorities so that we can coordinate our science and focus it where it's most needed. So, so thank you for, uh, for emphasizing that for us. Thank you. All right, the next three speakers to please come to the microphones, Leah Montgomery. Patricia Eckel and Michael Walsh. Good afternoon. Um, Leah Montgomery. I am very fortunate. I live on the shore of Lake Michigan on the Door Peninsula in Wisconsin. The colors of the rising sun or the shimmering light of a full moon will take my breath away. There's no more beautiful place except maybe here in pure Michigan. <laughs> Something happens when you live on the water every day. <clears throat> it becomes a part of who you are. And if I am anything, I am a mother and I am worried. When friends or family come to the beach to look for chain coral or washed up treasures, most often what we find is thick green algae soup. It smells worse than it looks. And I wonder if this lake is choking to death. I watch mergansers and golden eyes fish for, or, or dive for fish in the winter. And I wonder how long this lake will sustain them. I listen to people in town debate why the lake is lower again this year or why the alewives are back. They convince themselves it's cyclical. They think the natural world will always rebound. But I wonder who is watching out for the water. This past spring, I joined Native Americans, Native American water walkers as they walked through Wisconsin with a bucket of water from the Gulf of Mexico. There were water walkers from the four directions, all making their way to Lake Superior, one step at a time, never stopping without ceremony, always conscious of every precious drop. There was power in their determination. They were doing it for the water. So here we are, all the stewards of the Great Lakes in one place, for one historic week, with workshops and guest speakers and receptions, 
Surely, we're the ones who watch out for the water. But I'm not so sure. Maybe a Great Lakes week is not enough. Maybe we should be in Washington today, occupying Pennsylvania Avenue, demanding that the study to separate the basins be done in 18 months, not five years. Demanding, <laughs> demanding protections against nuclear and hazardous waste shipping. Demanding um, bans on tar sands pipelines, mining explorations, gas and oil drilling. We should be demanding basin-wide regulations for ballast water before governors like mine never lower the standards. We should know without doubt that our Great Lakes water will never become a commodity and that all commercial export of water, including bottled, will be banned forever. We should be determined to protect and respect the water for the gift that it is. We need assurances from our government that these Great Lakes waters will be a heritage that belongs to the ages. We need a Great Lakes Commons protected bioregion. We need a Great Lakes National Park. Aldo Leopold asked in 1924 if we were sufficiently enlightened yet to challenge the dogma of industry. Sadly, almost a hundred years later, I'm afraid the answer is no. We should all be inspired by the devotion of the Ojibwe grandmothers who walked to honor the life and spirit of our water. Maybe we should all commit to walking to our next meeting. Maybe we should walk to Washington. Thank you very much. Minkwetch. Um, I, I would just make one comment. Uh, if half the people walk to Washington, some of them ought to walk to Ottawa, because these lakes will not survive unless it's a binational effort. And um, there's, there's good work and, and, and real demands coming out of both uh, national capitals, but you know, if, if you walk away from one thing, away with one idea, let's think binational to get the job done. Um, my name is Patricia Eckel. I'm a research botanist at the Buffalo Museum of Science in Buffalo, New York, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. I don't know if my comments reflect those institutions, but they have something to do with the uh, research that I've been doing at Niagara Falls uh, that extends back to the period in the 1880s uh, when the IJC was first invented and the issues having to do with hydroelectric power allocation between uh, Canada and the United States, Canada being newly founded. Uh, I learned a bunch of things here as far as my research is concerned because my research really focuses on botany and not on groups and people and social agendas. But I did learn that uh, in the 1909 Water Boundary Treaties Act, uh, there were three main focal points and one of them is the physical integrity of the Great Lakes. And I would like to post an objection that the IJC or any of the other officials um, who are um, entrusted to uh, implement the treaty that they have sort of fallen down on that one because the physical integrity of the Great Lakes witness uh, Georgian Bay <clears throat> is no one would say that the integrity that body of water um, has not been challenged. Uh, and my question really has to do with hydrological issues uh, in the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, we, several of our speakers, and, and the new initiative, the Climatic Change Annex, or something that I think I saw was going to study the effects of climate, climate change. And I've heard many people talk about how the um, extreme weather events 
that have happened this year um, and maybe in previous years are all water, I mean, wet problems, uh, but there have been drought problems. And these cycles, I imagine, have to do with whether the jet stream comes in through Los Angeles or through Portland, Oregon. So we're talking about La Nina and El Nino and the effects on the weather patterns and the impact that has on the entire Great Lakes system and the, all the issues that everybody is uh, mentioning here. And of course the IJC has to uh, devote its scientific attention to um, these fluctuations because they will present um, uh, hydrological challenges. When there was a drought, I don't know, what, five years ago or so, the water levels in Lake Superior and all the lakes went down uh, significantly, but especially in the Georgian Bay area. And, uh, and those people apparently are still struggling with an issue having to do with the uh, St. Clair River. Now, in my researches, it seems to me that the hydroelectric power at both, okay, one of the vulnerabilities of the IJC is that it is, even though it stated at the beginning of today's session that it was an independent body, it's limited by what the government asks it to do. And I'm wondering how independent it is if it identifies a Great Lakes problem that needs to be addressed and the government doesn't want it to, whether that problem will not be addressed. I know that Ontario Hydro and the New York Power Authority require certain levels of Lake Erie water in order for uh, adequate water to go through the Niagara River for them to generate power, reliable and sustainable power. And so there, it's really crucial what the uh, levels in Lake Erie are. And with the problem in the dredging in the uh, St. Clair River, that dredging took place in 1964, and they started to generate power at Niagara Falls in 1964, too. And I'm just curious if that okay. was just would you, would you like me to respond? Well, thank you. Yeah, I, you're, I, think, uh, I think your time has elapsed, so I don't want to be unfair, right. but if you continue to talk, you're taking other people's time, and that's unfair to them. So let's, let, me, let me try and be responsive just very briefly, and thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're right. You're, um, you, raise, you raise important issues as to not all water issues relate to water quality. Some relate to water quantity, and that, of course, has a, a big impact on the ecosystem. Um, and we have had a, a, a long, we've been wrestling for a long time on, on the uh, Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River uh, issues and, and now more recently also on the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, uh, so we have, I'm not going to be able to answer this short, in, in a short form, but we have studied with the best science that we've been able to find independent of governments, without them in any way trying to uh, influence the outcome of these studies and the recommendations that we will make, um, it is hard to balance perfectly. It is impossible to balance conflicting needs perfectly. There are uh, hydropower needs that are written into the agreement, there's navigation needs, there's ecological needs, there's riparian interests, and, you know, one person's high water is another person's relief that their, their cottage is not going to be uh, swept o away. But you're right, the problems are there, they're legitimate, there are no perfect answers, but I am, frankly, as a new, relatively new commissioner, impressed at the integrity and the seriousness with which the IJC addresses these issues, and that's about the best I can say right now, and I think we, I, I, I know you're concerned, but we're not going to get into a back and forth on this right now. Um, uh, there's a Commissioner Glantz down here who would be happy to talk to you, and I don't say that just because she's there and I'm here. Uh, but Commissioner Dareth Glantz is extraordinarily well informed. She's one of our lead commissioners on the issues that you have uh, raised, and perhaps you'll catch her uh, or me after the program. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Walsh uh, with the Detroit River Canadian Cleanup uh, Public Advisory Committee. 
I arrived in Canada in 1970, and I can attest to the remarkable improvements to the condition of Lake Erie and the Great Lakes that resulted from the actions that were taken under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of 1972. So I'm a big fan of the Water Quality Agreement. Now, as a member of the Public Advisory Committee to the Detroit River Area of Concern, I believe that since about 87, when the latest changes were made, the progress on an improvement in the lakes has, has sputtered and the rate of, of improvement has slowed. And one of the reasons for the earlier fast progress, I believe, was that the IJC played a more direct role in holding the governments up to public account by their independent biennial assessments of progress. That's true. And it is clear that that has not happened recently. And my concern is that the IJC be given that role again in the new agreement. And so my, I have a couple of questions uh, just related to that to the commissioners Pollack and Trepanier, uh, the IJC was set up to have a role independent of the government. Has the IJC been consulted about the proposed changes to the role of the IJC in the new agreement? And have you agreed to these changes? And a question to uh, Michael Goffin, what are the changes to the role of the IJC in the new agreement? Could you give us some specifics about that? And then just one final uh, comment to Michael. I commend you on your support for science. Uh, I just hope that the Canadian government shows the same support for science because it's not evident with the firing of so many Environment Canada scientists at Burlington uh, recently. But. We have been consulted, we gave our opinion, we made some recommendations, and obviously uh, we're not going to come up with the answer. Uh, the, the, the negotiators will, will do their job, and uh, our role, well, we hope that our role will be increased, uh, and that we're, we'll have the tools necessary to make the appropriate assessment and do the job that we want to do. Uh, but that's as far as I can tell you at this point in time. Something. No. No. Maybe I could just uh, add uh, Susan and Hedman. Uh, Susan Hedman and I will uh, talk further about the uh, water quality agreement and, in particular, the role of the IGC tomorrow morning. So that's a, a plug for coming back tomorrow. Uh, but, but on the specific issue of accountability, <coughs> I think we went back to basics, or or we're doing that in our discussions. So we're saying, you know, the the first thing the IJC needs in order to to do a job in terms of accountability is they need to receive the information to assess. So, so the requirement that was mentioned today uh, for uh, a progress report of the parties, which is comprehensive in going through the agreement and, uh, and reporting on commitments, is a, is a major step forward. The notion is that that report would be done uh, every three years and that the IJC would have a job in not only reviewing that independently and, and commenting to governments, but also engaging the public in reviewing that and, and providing that, uh, that public uh, oversight to, uh, to the progress of government. And then, then the other thing, which is, is really basic, but if you don't have a clear and up-to-date agreement, then the commitments aren't appropriate and you can't be held accountable or you shouldn't be accountable for out-of-date commitments. So just modernizing that agreement, focusing it on the priorities, requiring a progress report and empowering the IJC to independently review those reports and to engage the public in that, I think is a huge advancement in, in accountability under the agreement. Um, the other thing I'll add, too, is when we talk about, when we have these discussions, they tend to be about the official reports. They tend to be about the official process for the back and forth. You know, I'll say this, um, you know, especially about the U.S. Uh, appointees to the commission, be very proud. These are not shy people. You know, when there are issues, when there are problems, they're in touch. 
with the, with the governments. Um, you know, they, they don't wilt from having those conversations. And I think, I think, you know, all of us ought to be very proud that we do have commissioners that are charged with looking out for the best interests of the Great Lakes. And I, I've seen it in action. I see it with Lana all the time and Dareth as well. So um, I think uh, be, be very proud of the commissioners that you have. They're really excellent, excellent people and very good public servants. Thank you very much, Cam. You know, you have a way of saying that I'm, and some of us are, are your worst nightmare and saying it very nicely. Okay, they, um, I'm going to, we're going to go high tech and I'm going to read it four tweets from Gail Kranzberg, but after that, the next two people will be Bruce Lindgren from Lake Superior Binational Forum and Barry Johnson, so if you can just get up. So these are, um, uh, I'm going to group these into two questions, for, and it's primarily about the um, negotiations for the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So these come from Gail Kranzberg. Um, two about accountability. One says, for accountability, will the triennial reports on progress be transmitted to Congress and Parliament? And the second one is, will the new executive committee have more senior accountability and authority compared to the current BAC? And then the other questions relate, they're also linked, they relate to the consultations that have gone on, I think in response to the presentation that was made. And she asks, um, or she says, the party's reports on the number of consultations, I think the number of webinars, <laughs> um, is a weak measure for quality of input, that the input on the, a draft text would be honest consultation, and why do the parties reject the call for stakeholders to have the opportunity to advise on the actual draft text of the new Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement? So maybe address accountability and then consultation. I guess that's for the representatives as the negotiators. You know, the accountability uh, under the agreement is a, is, um, a, ch a challenging subject. Uh, you know, what, what drives action under the agreement? Uh, the agreement helps to set uh, uh, shared vision, shared goals, uh, shared objectives. It provides frameworks for working together. But what really uh, drives the action are budgets of multiple jurisdictions uh, in both countries, uh, which implement national, province-wide, statewide programs. Uh, all of those ju jurisdictions have their own accountability mechanisms. Uh, Environment Canada reports to Parliament comprehensively on all of its programs, as does every other agency that, that invo is involved with the, uh, the agreement. So what we're doing is, with, with that groundwork, uh, we're putting an overlay on, which is how do we uh, assess progress uh, under the agreement and assess the uh, the delivery of the commitments, and and so there there is no uh, requirement within the agreement for uh, uh, reports on the agreement going to to Parliament or Congress. I won't won't speak for my U.S. Uh, colleagues. In in terms of senior level of accountability at the uh, uh, the executive committee, uh, the executive committee is comprised of. Uh, the most senior level managers of uh, uh, of a number of those agencies that are responsible for the agreement and and it is a decision making body in terms of uh, establishing uh, joint strategies but again, I think we have to be cautious that the that what we 're doing is agreeing on uh, common approaches. Uh, common strategies, and so so we have to be conscious of what type of decisions are being made under the agreement um, as well. I, I will say that one of the things that the IJC, uh, the Commission has asked uh, be included, and, and again, we've not seen the, we've not seen the language either, but we have asked that their, the uh, governments make a commitment to responding to uh, the IJC's, uh, which will be now triennial reports, 
within a reasonable period of time, which we said, suggested was six months. So that, as somebody suggested earlier, uh, we apparently wrote a report um, uh, in 97, and, and I don't know if it's accurate that we're still waiting for a response. And uh, so uh, we, we would like, in the case of the agreement and our charge to review and assess, that there be a specific response. Now, in the U.S. form of government, of course, the administrative branch cannot guarantee that Congress will hold a hearing, but they could commit uh, to an you know, to the uh, administration making a response. And in the Canadian system, if my civics holds me right, you could do both all in one. <laughs> we'll see what's in the could you address the question about the uh, draft text and whether it's going to be available for public consultation? Uh, the, the short answer is no, that, that in an international negotiation we've been advised that uh, we, we are unable to share that draft text. The, the draft text uh, has to be approved uh, through uh, domestic processes in Canada that will require uh, going to cabinet, uh, and so it falls under uh, the provisions of cabinet confidentiality, and so we're not able to to share that text. So, what we're trying to do is to share the uh, uh, the concepts, and we've done that uh, today. We'll do some more of that tomorrow, and uh, and how those actually get written up, and and the sentence structure, and those things we can't uh, we can't share. <clears throat> so, do you want to go? Okay. Uh, my name is Bruce Lindgren. I'm the uh, United States co chair for the Lake Superior Binational Forum, and uh, I want to uh, express my thanks for this uh, town hall meeting and the opportunity to address you. Uh, I'm sure my Canadian counterpart, Mr. Glenn Dale, would, uh, would like to be here, but he was uh, unable to. Uh, the Lake Superior Forum, Binational Forum was uh, initiated in 1991. Uh, we are 24 uh, members, 12 from the United States, 12 from Canada, that uh, represent uh, geographic areas around the Lake Superior Basin and also uh, various sectors. We're, uh, I think, a little unique as an organization in that our members uh, represent economic development, academics, uh, certainly environmental organizations, uh, Native, Native American First Nation um, uh, participants. We have one of our members uh, is a uh, Lutheran minister representing the faith community. Uh, another uh, is deeply involved with uh, uh, on the water recreation. So when we discuss issues, we get uh, a number of different points of view. The uh, forum, uh, from its inception, uh, focused on, of course, the restoration and, and protection of Lake Superior. And uh, back in the uh, early 1990s, did two important things. One was to establish the vision for Lake Superior, which begins with the words that were used uh, earlier, uh, water is life, and the quality of water determines the quality of life. Another thing that the, the forum did in those early uh, days was to recognize that Lake Superior is a bit unique among the Great Lakes uh, uh, in addition to its size. Uh, it is also a lake that has had uh, relatively little impact because of uh, uh, urbanization and, and such. Our the population of the Lake Superior Basin is a small fraction of what it is around Lake Erie. The, um, uh, early members of the forum uh, urged, uh, I think through the IJC and uh, through our sponsors, Environment Canada and the Environmental Protection Agency, to establish the Zero uh, Discharge Demonstration Project, uh, which uh, continues and we've seen some uh, slides today showing the uh, reductions in some of these, uh, these particular chemicals. The, um, the forum has also contributed uh, through its uh, public input role to the uh, uh, development of the uh, goals and objectives for the, uh, for the LAMP. 
We um, uh, have carried out a number of projects, but probably the most important thing we do is hold public input sessions in communities all around the Lake Superior Basin. And in doing so, we learn uh, from uh, members of the public about issues that affect them. And often uh, that input is quite um, uh, emotional with uh, concerns for their uh, areas of concern, the aquatic invasive species, uh, recently mining has come up as a, as a major issue. And as one uh, just final uh, point, I uh, want to express some concern uh, about the funding for the, uh, the binational program. We've some sense that that funding has become sort of uh, asymmetrical and that <clears throat> that asymmetry uh, does have an impact on the binational uh, nature of our uh, efforts to protect and restore Lake Superior. So I would urge uh, members of the IJC and others to use the relationships that you developed in order to encourage uh, substantial uh, and equal funding uh, for uh, protection and restoration of Lake Superior and the entire Great Lakes. So thank you. And on the last point, sir, um, on the last point, uh, asymmetrical funding. Anything that's asymmetrical is, is, it has a hard time staying in, in balance. And um, as an old politician or as a recovering politician, uh, I know uh, to whom the, uh, the, the members of parliament um, might be listening, and it wouldn't be to you know some American commissioner. Uh, they listen to their constituents like everybody else. So, if if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because the people of Canada say this is important to us. Thank you. And we heard you. One of the realities, though, is we're talking about major changes to the water quality agreement. We're talking about moving to address new threats to strengthen other commitments, that's going to require uh, a hard look at all of the ways that we have done business, not just on public engagement, but on everything we've done, and a refocusing of, of some of those, uh, those approaches. And that's a process that, that I think is going to have to go hand in glove with the, uh, the implementation of the new agreement, and that's, that's just part of the reality. So, so we are looking at our approaches to engagement. Um, you know, it's, it's not saying that the current approaches don't work, but we're going to be asking whether there are other approaches that could be more effective. We're doing the same with our, uh, our science and our monitoring. We're doing the same with our implementation activities, and that's, that's part of responding to the new agreement. Barry Johnson was the next person. Hi, Barry Johnson, Wayne State University History and the Greening of Detroit. Our mission is to restore the Great Lakes. I, we, we need to concentrate on the land as well to prevent, uh, to, to prevent runoff, to reduce the hardscape. Um, we, we should try to improve the, the green infrastructure. We need to look at restoring the landscape, looking at the wetlands and looking at the forests. I, I think including urban forests. We at the Greening of Detroit have been planting trees in the Rouge River in, uh, watershed for the last three weeks now, along with the De Detroit Water and Sewage Department. So it's, as you politicians say, it's a shovel-ready um, project. It's actually in motion. The Rouge River watershed runs into the Detroit River, so we, by planting trees there, we're actually reducing the, the pollutants and the nutrients that are going into the river. Uh, I think studies are needed to assess the costs and the benefits of doing, uh, you know, massive green infrastructure tree planting. And speaking of invasive species, there's emerald ash borer in, in the Great Lakes Forest right now are killing millions of trees, but I don't see where you guys in your listings have this listed as an invasive species. And because they're killing trees, it's obviously reducing the amount of water that's being consumed by them and also the amount of oxygen that's being generated by them. 
So shouldn't this be in, in, included in your list? That's what my question is. And I think we need to get forestry involved in this whole thing as far as um, cleaning up the Great Lakes because most of the pollutants are coming from the land. Thank you. I don't know how to answer that. Well, maybe just, you know, uh, listening to you describe uh, tree planting efforts, uh, you know, we're seeing some terrific examples of successes in some of the, uh, the areas of concern. And I'm thinking about my hometown of Toronto, where we have uh, tremendous fish populations in, uh, in Toronto Harbour now, uh, 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 fish populations moving up the rivers, uh, naturalization uh, programs. So I think we can, we can show that those types of efforts uh, are paying off in very real, very tangible ways. And you know, maybe one of the things that we do need to do a better job of is communicating all of those successes. And as far as um, land use goes, you're, you're absolutely right. It's one of, the <clears throat> one of the things that really impacts the Great Lakes. And there's a very, Im but municipal players are very, very important in terms of trying to bring the Great Lakes back to life. Um, I'd like to see if Dave Ulrich is here in the audience. Dave here in this corner uh, helps to run the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative very effective organization in terms of land use planning. Uh, we, need to, we need to keep uh, supporting good cities doing good work on their best land use practices as well. So thank you for the, uh, thank you for the comment. <clears throat> yes, our, our next three speakers, Mel Visser, Catherine Massan, and Lynn Katz Chari. Ready? I'm uh, Mel Visser. I've been a resident of the Great Lakes State here since 1938, and uh, I was educated in chemistry, chemical engineering at Michigan Tech, chemistry at Western, spent an industrial career at the Upjohn Company for 36 years, and in that job, uh, I was responsible for environmental protection and had the privilege of being the founding co-chair of the Great Lakes Corporate Environmental Council, which was a, an assemblage of U.S. and Canadian leaders from the environmental and industry community that were forced to sit down together and discuss their problems mutually. It was a fantastic education. When I retired, I wondered why PCBs remained in Lake Superior at constant values. Didn't make sense from my background. I took several trips to the Arctic, plugged into international efforts, and found that PCBs were not the biggest problem with Lake Superior. In spite of the efforts of the Binational Forum and others, Lake Superior has a toxaphene concentration that is 18 times the Michigan standard, which according to the 2008 Lake Superior LAMP is the most lenient of standards. Toxaphene in Lake Superior in the edible flesh of Lake Superior lake trout would be called hazardous waste if it was outside Washington or Ottawa. I'm glad to see uh, in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement on the net that toxaphene concentrations are uh, recognized as they come up and they're recognized that Lake Superior was the uh, uh, toxaphene levels are the highest uh, of any around and indeed they are the highest in North America. Uh, you commissioners are new. I'd just like to give some background on uh, where they're coming from. 
where toxic, why toxaphene is such a problem and remains a problem. In 1995, 94, 95, there was some great research done by the EPA on the Lake Michigan mass balance, studying PCB flows in and out of Lake Michigan. There, the surprising finding was that PCBs were venting from Lake Michigan. Just think of how fast they were invent venting in 78. But basically, these pops, the persistent organic pollutants that we've banned, come into the lakes in uh, the winter and vent in the summer. And they travel, they come from, uh, that's what the mass balance found. Canadians found that PCBs were in human milk in <coughs> southern Ontario at levels uh, that were remaining constant and went up to the Arctic to find a pristine background sample. There they found that the women, Inuit women in Broughton Island, were consuming 15 times the tolerable daily intake of PCBs and pesticides. That led to no time remaining, but I'll, I, I want to give you just a little bit more here. Uh, that led to the international effort, which led to the Stockholm Convention, which unfortunately focused on DDT and dioxin. The problems in the Arctic were chloridane and toxic.